Our guest today is John Prescott, an authority on how to negotiate matters of climate change. As we welcome you here, John, today, let me first begin by asking you that we've heard all sorts of opinions held forth by academicians, by environmentalists, activists. What does the politician in you have to say? After all, it is your opinion that goes into the making of legislations, into the making of government policies. As a big statement about what is taking place, a new form of industrialization that must not continue to poison the world, it covers all the policies, it covers the objectives of sustainable economy. One of the problems I've got with it is the politicians themselves and community in the kind of political will to implement it. Having gone through the Kyoto negotiations on one at Kyoto, the next one, it's not 40 nations, it's 90 nations. That's going to be much more difficult and will need more political will. John, you speak of Kyoto as an architect of the process. If I may ask you, there was another process that went alongside the process of building consensus. We are now approaching the second round. What lessons do you think we carry from Kyoto 1? Well, what's critical about it, of course, if you want a consensus, you've got to put it across a lot of nations, and therefore it's the principles that govern it. Kyoto 1 was just about industrial nations, who were two-thirds of the emissions around the world. We're saying you've got to cut it, and they agreed to, and in a marginal way that was occurred. On the second Kyoto 2, it involves every country, and now different from 10 years or 15 years ago, all the emissions are now coming from developing countries, two-thirds, not one-third. That's largely China, I admit. India only has a small amount of those emissions. Different circumstances in different countries. So what we've got to find something that treats each country equitably, is concerned about reducing unemployment. It has the UN pr uh, principle, which is each equal responsibilities and a common objectives, that means the developed countries have got to be allowed to grow to reduce their poverty, while the developed countries, differently than the developing, have got to use technology to reduce the carbon emissions. So how you get everybody to uh, sign up to that is the big challenge. But national governments are being accused of not being able to put their money where their mouth is. On the other hand, there are federated sub-national governments, say in Quebec or in California, that have achieved much more. They've been much more influential. What, what, is, what is this? Why, why has it happened like this? Well, as a professional talker, you wouldn't accept me to condemn that. If you want consensus for 90 countries, you actually have got to get them all together and find what's common road them and still satisfies the demand that we won't get the catastrophe that's going to come from the increase in uh, greenhouse gases. So it is always difficult to get that agreement. And these conferences you learn a lot from. I think the contrast I tried to in my speech this, the Davos in Switzerland a week or so ago, was all the rich people in the world, the bankers, the political, all the Western interests, right? I know there were one or two uh, leaders there from the developing countries. And here you have them talking about what is really in that report, the world we want, a sustainable world, one that reduces poverty, that treats people fairly and equal. That wasn't Davos in Switzerland. That's the division between a rich and a poor. And I think these conferences are critical to build that political will to say, hang on, we've got to make changes. What we, business as usual is not acceptable. Davos and Switzerland, bankers there telling us what to do. The bankers ruined the ruddy world, for God's sake. We've got to say, you were the architects of an awful lot of the crises we've got at the moment. We want a different approach. And I think the one, the world we want, is what we've got to get to the top of the list. Much has been said on what the Future We Want document has to offer. But there's also some talk of the missed opportunity. The missed opportunity on you know, topics like governance with regard to governance, what do you want to say? No, not just simply, you still won't bankers, I've got to tell you, I'm not, <laughs> it won't be bankers of the world unite, I mean they do that at the moment. You still need finance, in fact at the heart of bringing these two differing uh, uh, parts of the world together is a lot of finance and you have to solve that. So there will be people dealing with finance and they're probably bankers, but their interest has to be what is in the world we want, not the world they want, which is about profit, exploitation, 
it's a different thing we have to change all that and by the way whether you're a banker or a seaman as i was if we don't solve this right the scientists are right by 2050 we'll be in a hell of a way and we'll all be affected whether you're a banker a worker or an agriculture worker or a seaman and then we come to the issue of the american government how did they tackle it and they are doing and that's what's needed you've got to recognize that in the industrialization process that's taken place in the developed world where we poison most of the world in the pro with the emission a high carbon economy developing countries are going to go through the same stage because you're dependent on oil and coal as the main energy source for the growth in your economies which are already twice the rate of the development countries and more it's highly polluting so the challenge is to get the developed countries to realize that their contribution of reducing emissions is largely a technological one whether it's the replacing of energy mixes etc but for the developing world you've got to recognize they have to grow at a faster rate why because most of the poverty is in those countries under a dollar a day if it's about equity if everybody's to sign up it's what is fair to all really and that doesn't mean equally when the americans said that the emissions of america are the same as china so this is a mathematical problem and you just all reduce together by a certain percentage no it is a moral question because if you take per capita in whether china or india that one and quarter billion people right that means you've got to measure it so in america it's 20 tons per person I think in China now it's gone because of its growth to 10 per person. In India, 2 and 3. Developing countries aspire to grow and reach where developed countries will be at some point in time. Well, in all countries, first of all, because each have different approaches to it. The Americans, right through Kyoto 1, rather opposed it. Whatever the American president's now saying, I hope that he will show leadership. He didn't on Kyoto 1, the Americans. Uh, but it's political will in different countries. In, in America, the fear is that climate change will cause unemployment and your gas in the car will go up. Well, frankly, we have shown you can get more jobs, we did in Britain, exceed the Kyoto targets. There are different ways of doing it, but you do have to change it. You can't leave it as business as usual, because business as usual has given us the kind of crisis we have at the moment. So the political will is not so great at the government level. They might want to argue it at all government levels. But the trouble is it doesn't make a great deal of headway as fast as it needs to be with the scientific predictions. So I want the political world to come lower down. So if you've got an action plan, I think in India, I was, I've been talking this week, you've got a government that makes its plans, but you've got something like 4,000 local governments that sub areas. Now, if they develop the action plan, which can be different in different parts, as you know, in India, and people begin to see the benefits of what they're doing and understand it, they will produce that support and the politicians will want to have the support of the electorate that's the democratic process which you have here and in my own country that can be the political world that gives governments the courage to actually do the difficult thing and get on with it and and then we come to the issue of the american government important point i mean the governor of florida but if you really go and listen to the man from quebec who was the premier there i was there when they launched this energy connection between the north of america america and canada the prime minister in canada was against it the american president was against it but these bodies what i call the local development action plans get on and do it something like 200 mayors in America signed up to a Kyoto agreement to implement it. California was a classic one as well. So that's the kind of force I want to develop, and it's slowly being reflected in Congress. Congress at the time of Kyoto voted something like 92 votes to two against any climate change. It's changed since then. That's the political will, the extreme weather, to have to get on and make a change. And the public know that. And that's the kind of political will and political pressure that matters. This would be accompanied by a certain degree of carbon emissions and a carbon footprint. What is the way out of this quagmire? Um, you mean for the 2016 agreement, Kyoto 2, yes. Sorry. Uh, when we get to that, you need America on board, but you know, I moved when America said under Bush that they weren't prepared to come. They thought that veto would have finished Kyoto 1. I moved the Americans, leave them out, go away if you don't want to do it. Thank goodness we had the Russians with us because you need to be, you have to get a percentage of the vote to get ratification. And I think that has to be the same today. And I mean, at that time when President, um, even uh, President Bush and followed by Obama, 
they couldn't get the agreement through the Congress. So you've got to have the political forces, not the pressure of the president, he's got a role to play, but he's got to have the support from the people at the bottom on all those that are elected every two years in their system to make changes. So that's where I think political will. The intellectual argument's there, and people understand it. The scientific argument is overwhelming. The physical evidence of the extreme weather's bringing it more home. We've just got to build on that and get the political will for the politicians to get the courage to do what we can avoid that the scientists tell us will it be a catastrophe if we don't find Kyoto too. And there is also the question of equity over here. Well, uh, they are actually beginning to see the extreme weather. They're saying, where is it coming from? It's not just one incident. I think we had to deal with the argument in the last 10 years where people were saying, well, if you look at the weather over a thousand years, it's not made any difference. I think, you know, a th you know, hundreds of scientists have come to the view it's not that. The melting of Arctic, doing all the trouble, is this just normal? Now everybody says it's not normal because all our space photography shows us it is going. That increases the water level, it increases the sea levels. And all of a sudden, and I think the President Obama said this, the coastal towns begin to flood and you're now talking a massive amount of populations that will be affected by raising waters. Sufficient for the Arctic and these areas to melt at this rate will cause the flooding. Everybody can see the sense of that argument. And Al Gore's arguments in America made quite a hit with people. The film's sense of the kind of catastrophes has made people think, and young people, young people want change. Because they know, as I say, 2050, I'll be dead. I won't know whether these policies worked or not, but I have an obligation to fight for them. And I say to young people, you'll be alive. And if we fail, you'll be the people that have to live with the consequences. I wouldn't like to live that, and I have an obligation. And President, um, Mr. Freeman said today, somebody asked him, well, shouldn't you leave it to young people? They often say, well, I'll leave it to you because I won't be here when it actually happens or not. He said, I'm 59 and I still want to stay in the game. I don't want to opt out. He's right, neither do I. Thank you very much for your time, John, and it's been a pleasure talking to you.